Kia ora team, welcome to video 8 in the 2.4 series. In this lesson you'll be learning about the cell cycle and DNA replication. By the end of this lesson you should be able to communicate the key stages of the cell cycle in words and a diagram, discuss the importance of DNA replication to the overall functioning of a cell and organisms, so this is in terms of surface area to volume ratio or the type of cell, discuss DNA replication in terms of where, when and how it occurs, and discuss the factors affecting the rate of DNA replication and relating this back to enzymes. So most somatic cells, so those are normal body cells, or cells that aren't eggs or sperm, need to be replaced and renewed constantly. So for example, red blood cells only live for about three months, so they need to be replaced to keep carrying oxygen around your body. And another example is muscle cells can get damaged when you exercise, so they need to be replaced so your muscles can get bigger and stronger. So the somatic cells in your body, like these kinds of cells, carry out specialized tasks, and when the time is right, they get ready to replicate and divide. The cell cycle is the term given to the life cycle of a cell. And it's an ordered sequence of events that occur in a cell as it prepares to divide for cell division and duplication. There are two main stages in the cell cycle. This is one, the interphase, and two, mitosis. Let's talk about the interphase part of the cell cycle. The cell spends the majority of its time in this interphase part of the cell cycle. And the interphase part can be divided further into three subphases. The first subphase is called the growth phase or the G1 phase. During this time, the cell carries out its functional role, and this includes carrying out its metabolic processes, so still making ATP, synthesizing proteins, so still making enzymes, and replicating or um, making more organelles like mitochondria. Once the cell has replicated its organelles, it needs to replicate its DNA. This brings a cell to the synthesis phase, or the S phase, of the cell cycle in the interphase. During this time, during this phase, the DNA inside the nucleus is replicated to create two identical copies of the genome. This is so that when the cell divides, each daughter cell will contain one copy of the genome each. And the two daughter cells will therefore be genetically identical. Once the cell has replicated its DNA, it carries out its final jobs to prepare for cell division in the second growth phase called G2. The cell makes more proteins that are necessary and it replicates more of its organelles like the mitochondria to prepare for mitosis. Also, the chromosomes are checked for errors and any required repairs to the DNA that was made in the previous phase. So G2 signifies the end of the interphase and the cell is now ready to divide. The second stage of the cell cycle is mitosis. The mitosis phase results in the division of a cell. And at the end of mitosis, the cell divides into two new daughter cells and the cell cycle will start again. The length of the cell cycle or the lifespan of a cell varies with the different types of cells that are in the body. For example, the cells lining our small intestines only have a lifespan of two to four days, which means its cell cycle only lasts two to four days. Whereas red blood cells, like I mentioned earlier, live for only three to four months, which means that the cell cycle lasts for three to four months. Video nine is all about mitosis. That is the next video. So why do cells divide? It's all about cell transport and surface area to volume ratio. Remember that in videos two and three, you learned that cells rely on efficient transport of materials. Cells are reliant on molecules going in and molecules going out in order to carry out important cell processes like photosynthesis and respiration that you've learned all about already. For example, for cells to carry out cellular respiration, they need glucose and oxygen to enter the cell and carbon dioxide and water to leave the cell. In order for the cells to carry out these processes, they rely on diffusion, active transport, osmosis, and so forth. And in order for these processes to be as efficient as possible, each cell needs to have a large surface area and a small volume. So in other words, they need to have a high surface area to volume ratio. 
Now during interphase, or these growing phases, the cell is increasing the number of organelles it has, which increases the volume of the cell as the cell cycle progresses through the growth phases. Now remember from video 2 that the volume increases by the power of 3, whereas the surface area only increases by the power of 2. This decreases the surface area to volume ratio and makes the cell transport processes less efficient. This decreasing surface area to volume ratio signals to the cell that it needs to replicate its DNA and it needs to divide. By dividing, it will be able to split this large cell into two smaller cells, which are more efficient at carrying out their cellular processes because this large cell has a low surface area to volume ratio, whereas the smaller cells they divide into has a higher surface area to volume ratio. Graph A here shows the changes in cell volume over the cell cycle. Through the three phases of the interface, so G1, S, and G2, volume increases. And when the cell undergoes mitosis, the cell volume drops back to its original size, resulting in the daughter cell being smaller and having an increased surface area to volume ratio. Now the quantity of DNA also changes throughout the cell cycle. A cell that enters the G1 phase has one copy of the full genome. But then during the S phase, DNA gets replicated to create two copies of all the genetic material within the cell. So by the G2 phase, the DNA quantity has doubled. But then when the cell divides during the M phase, the quantity of DNA halves again and goes back to what it was in the G1 phase. And the cycle begins again. This picture helps you visualize the number of chromosomes in each stage of the cell cycle. When DNA gets replicated in the S phase, an unreplicated pair of chromosomes become a replicated pair of chromosomes, and these replicated pair of chromosomes contain two identical sister chromatids. So these two here are identical, and these two here are identical. You're probably wondering what's the difference between black and white? Well, this black and this white came from two different parents. So this one, let's say that it came from the father, and this one came from the mother. When it replicates, you see that the paternal chromosomes duplicate, and the maternal chromosomes also duplicate. These two sister chromatids of the paternal side and these two sister chromatids on the maternal side then get split up during mitosis, and each resulting cell, each daughter cell, contains one copy of each unreplicated chromosome. You can see that there's only one chromatid here because the other chromatid went to the other daughter cell. It's important for a cell to replicate its DNA before mitosis so that each of the daughter cells contains the full set of genetic information before the daughter cell starts its own cell cycle. Each daughter cell needs to have a full set of DNA in order to carry out its functions. And this process of replicating DNA is called DNA replication. DNA replication happens during the S phase of the interface and takes place in the nucleus of the cell before it divides. And DNA replication is a semi-conservative process. This is because each new molecule of DNA contains one strand that is originally from the parent molecule, so it's conserved. So here's the blue strand representing the parent molecule, and the blue strand here representing the parent molecule, and one new strand, so the green strands, which represent the daughter strands. In other words, each new DNA double helix has one original template, the blue, and one new daughter strand, the green. You must be able to describe the steps during DNA replication. You don't need to know any of the names of the enzymes that I'll be talking about soon, but you must be able to label the DNA double helix diagram above. This actually came from a past NCA exam question. You must also be able to discuss semi-conservative replication. Now there are five steps to DNA replication that I would like you to learn. Step one, unwinding the double helix. An enzyme found in the nucleus called helicase unwinds the DNA double helix. It does this by breaking the hydrogen bonds between the nitrogen bases. And the point of unwinding the DNA double helix, the point of breaking these hydrogen bonds, is to expose the A's, the T's, the C's, and the G's. And the exposed strands are now called template strands. Step 2. Complementary base pairing. New nucleotides found inside the nucleus are joined to the exposed bases on the template strands according to the complementary base pairing rules. This complementary base pairing rules 
is that the rule is that A always binds with T and C always binds with G. Step 3. Extending the daughter strands. Another enzyme binds to the nucleotides together to form a new DNA strand. These new strands of DNA are now called daughter strands. And the daughter strands are always built in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So, the two new daughter strands of DNA always get built in the opposite directions to each other. Can you see that the daughter strand here is being built this way to, to the left, and the daughter strand down here is built this way to the right. One of these strands is called the leading strand, and the other is called the lagging strand. So what's the difference between the leading and the lagging daughter strands? The leading strand is built continuously from the 5' prime to the 3' prime direction. In this diagram here, the green arrow is pointing to the left, which shows the direction of the replication for the leading strand, 5' prime to 3' prime. Whereas the lagging strand has to be built in fragments in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. This is because only a small part of the template strand, this blue bit here, is exposed at a time. And the small segments of new DNA, so this new green parts, are called Okazaki fragments. The Okazaki fragments need to be connected together by another enzyme called DNA ligase. Step 4. Two identical DNA molecules are formed. DNA replication on both leading and lagging strands continues until two new molecules of DNA are produced. Each resulting DNA molecule has one strand from the original molecule, so one strand of it is the template strand, and the other strand is the new daughter strand. This is called semi-conservative replication, because each DNA molecule that's formed has one parent strand and one daughter strand. And finally, step number five, DNA condenses into chromosomes as it prepares for self-division. Now, prior to the cell dividing, Two identical copies of the DNA molecule are going to coil and supercoil to form replicated chromosomes. So when the cell divides, each new daughter cell will only have one copy of each chromosome and they'll be genetically identical. So what do you need to know about enzyme function during DNA replication? Enzymes are involved in each step of DNA replication. So here's an enzyme here, here's an enzyme here, here's an enzyme here. Here is an enzyme there. You don't need to know the names of these enzymes, but you need to know that in each step of the way, different enzymes are working. So during DNA replication, there's a specific enzyme that unwinds the DNA double helix, exposing the nucleotide bases. There's also another enzyme that makes the new daughter DNA strands by adding free nucleotides to the template. And there's also another enzyme, DNA polymerase, that uses the bases of the parent template strand as a complementary template, matching bases with a complementary base pairing rule, so A with T and C with G. Now we can't finish until we've talked about the factors affecting enzymes during DNA replication. Because enzymes are involved in each step of DNA replication, the rate of DNA replication is dependent on the factors affecting enzyme action. Now, because DNA replication is an important part of the cell cycle, these factors that affect enzyme activity are also going to affect cell cycle and therefore the ability of the enzyme to repair itself and grow. If DNA replication stops, the whole cell cycle and growing stops as well. Now, DNA replication occurs most efficiently when all of the relevant factors are at their optimum level. And small changes from the optimum level may result in small changes in the rate of efficiency of DNA replication. Okay, so we're going to look at temperature, pH, substrate concentration, cofactors, enzyme concentration, poisons, and inhibitors. Temperature. Remember that all enzymes have an optimum temperature. And at very low temperatures, the enzyme action slows. And at high temperatures, the 3AD shape of the enzyme might change and denature. Denaturation is irreversible, and that means the enzyme is inactive. pH. All enzymes have an optimum pH range, and outside of this optimum range can cause an enzyme's active site to denature, preventing the substrates from binding. Remember that pH affects hydrogen bonds. Substrate concentration. 
An increase in substrate concentration means more substrate can combine with an enzyme's active site and increase the rate of reaction until all the enzyme molecules become saturated and the rate of reaction levels off. In the case of DNA replication, some of the most important substrates are the deoxyribonucleotides, the free nucleotide bases that are joined together to create the new daughter strands of DNA. Cofactors and coenzymes like magnesium ions can alter the shape of the enzyme's active site so that it can effectively combine with substrates. A decrease in these cofactors like magnesium would reduce the rate of reaction or even stop the enzyme from working altogether. Enzyme concentration. So remember that high enzyme concentration allows for increased rate of reaction up until the point of the rate limiting step. And finally, poisons. Poisons alter or block the active site, which prevents substrates from binding. So the presence of an inhibitor may be a limiting factor, despite other factors being at their optimum levels. You've reached the end of the video, well done. So by now you should be able to communicate the key stages of the cell cycle, discuss the importance of DNA replication to the overall functioning of the cell in terms of surface area to volume ratio or the type of cell, discuss DNA replication in terms of where, when, and how it happens, and discuss the factors affecting the rate of DNA replication relating this to enzymes. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.